my name is Maureen Higgins with Wings of Freedom. And I'm excited to be here in Augsburg, Germany with Ed Bell Bruno. And I'm excited to interview him because he's, he and I have talked a lot about how the sciences, art, and spirituality go together. And Ed has been a lifelong painter since he's been a child with, with oil painting and acrylics. And he makes these amazing space art and abstract art. And he's also a celestial mechanics mathematician, and he's been doing that since the 1980s, an astrophysicist. And he's been a lifelong spiritual seeker and practicing of it, and has had some really exciting results. Not because he's done it necessarily uh, on purpose in terms of experimenting, but he's used a technique over and over again about surrendering any angst or worries to you could say letting them go so that you can manifest your optimal outcome. And it's, it's made such a difference in his life that I wanted him to talk about that and also to talk some about simultaneous universes. So first I thought we'd talk to Ed about what he thinks about the connection between the art, the sciences, and spirituality. Okay, uh, thanks Maureen. I'm really happy to be here. Um, yeah, so it's it's hard to uh, give a quick summary of, of what what it means to do all three of those things, but from my experience, um, I can say that if if you, I'll just give an example from my scientific research. Um, I, I've I've done as you'll hear later on. I've done art uh, much younger than when I got involved in science. Um, however, um, the the idea is that. Uh, if I'm doing a scientific uh, research problem of some type and I want to like make progress with it, um, if, if I try to beat my head against the desk, so to speak, and get nowhere at the problem if I'm trying to solve it, um, that's the usual approach one would normally take. You, you can't get anywhere in a problem if you're trying to do it and you just go over and over and over again to try to solve it using the same thing and coming up with negative results every time, which is not surprising. Um, and if you do this for years, eventually you make a little breakthrough, and by small breakthrough and by small breakthrough, eventually, if you're lucky, you'll solve the problem that you want to work on. Um, but there's a quicker way to do this, and a way which uh, bypasses all those years, and where well, you could actually solve the problem instantly without any effort, but it, it does take a radically different approach. And the approach is, is to look at the problem you're doing and give up the idea that you want to control how you're going to try to solve it. And you sort of surrender yourself to the universe, so to speak, and ask for guidance in how you might want to solve the problem without doing it the traditional way. And uh, a particular vehicle I use if I'm trying to solve a math problem is I'll, I'll step away from that and say, let me do a painting. Now, one would think that you would never want to go to artwork if you're doing a highly rigorous detailed mathematical proof or something like designing as you'll find out later it's like designing trajectories of spacecraft to the moon or Jupiter who would ever think our art would have anything to do with that and yet in my experience the biggest breakthroughs I've made is when um, I let go of the tradi traditional techniques you would do to do a problem like that or do a problem in astrophysics or or even other fields of math and you rather go to a painting and and and, and put it out there that First of all, you're going to relinquish all control of how you want to solve the problem. And second of all, you're open to new ideas from the universe through the artwork. And number three, you would like to see what will the artwork reveal if you look at it. And if you do a painting quick enough without really thinking about the art too much and, and, and do the painting from a subconscious perspective, and you do work rapidly so you can't think too much, the idea is you don't want to think very much because your thoughts will ruin it. Um, you would like to let your subconscious be the guide here. And so if you allow yourself to do a painting from the subconscious level quickly and you, and you make an affirmation ahead of time, I want to do this painting with the hope that it will reveal the problem I want to solve. You put that out there first, then you let go of any control, and then you do your painting. And when you're done with the painting, you don't think about anything when you're doing the painting. You just let the universe guide you. And then when the painting is done, you take a look at it and say, is there anything in this painting that has any bearing whatsoever on the math problem I was trying to solve. And from my experience, I've seen several times not just a guideline, but actually a solution of very, very complicated problems, one of which, which you'll find out later in this uh, video, uh, 
that will be shown that you can actually find a revolutionary new ways to get spacecraft to the moon, Mars, and beyond. Um, that is a complete paradigm shift from the way it was done previously. So this is what, what, is, what is revealed when you let, uh, as I put it, let your subconscious and art be your guide. Now you may not want to use art, you could use something else, but the, the idea is if you, if you go at a problem headstrong and you try to do it with a typical way of thinking, you'll probably get the typical results, which is none. So what you have to do is um, try something different and let the creative process guide your subconscious is what you're doing. So that's how those two work. That's how the art and the math or science work together. Now there's a third element in there, which is the spirituality, and, and I sort of snuck that in there because the spirituality is, is embraced in the term I said, let the universe guide you and you let your subconscious be the guide. That statement is the spirituality part. So you have to have the trust in the universe that the universe will guide you through the art to make the discovery that you're trying to do or the solution you're trying to come up with. So it's those three things working together which give you the solution. Now you can't, if you're not in the science, you can't hope to solve a science problem by doing this. You have to have a good science background and be an expert in the field to, to begin with. Then you use these tools and they will work for you. But it's three things in operation there. It's the, the art, which expresses yourself, the subconscious, which is part of the universe, and the universe itself with the trust, and they all come together to reveal themselves, if you do this correctly, in, in the case of art, in the actual brush strokes. And really, you have found to solve a lot of really amazing problems doing that, including the orbit to the moon using no fuel, where you had a major letting go, meaning you had to let go of any worries or angst so that you could let something new come in for you. So it's almost mm -hmm. like letting go of the angst and the worry allows some, something greater than yourself. Some people may call it, we, you know, we like to call it the universe or the higher self. Some people would just say God or, or whatever the term is for yourself, that how you think of that term for the universe or for that spirit greater than yourself and then you can let that come through and give you the solutions. Is that kind of how you would think of it, Ed? Yes, exactly. And, and, um, if, and, and you know, the problems I've solved with this are not little problems. Uh, the one with, uh, what, the one with uh, getting spacecraft to the moon using less fuel actually, actually will be described in, the, in this interview later um, in more, much more detail. Um, that, that's a way to um, utilize these methods where you come up with extremely precise ways to guide spacecraft which are worth hundreds of millions of dollars to their destination by being guided by a painting and you would never believe that could happen. And then, then after that was done I applied the same methods to uh, an astrophysics problem in, in, on the origin of the moon and coming up with a new approach to that um, with, with a colleague, uh, Richard Gott. Um, J.R. got three, um, to be more precise, and a professor at Princeton, um, and also using those same techniques uh, that, that, that revealed uh, a way to solve what's called the lithopanspermia problem on the existence, how did life form on Earth, and, and that actually is based on finding new ways to, to, for trajectories to bring, uh, uh, ways to bring biogenic material, which I'll talk about later, to the Earth to create life. And, and that was also uh, solved by this, partially solved by the same method. So these are some pretty major problems. And however, the first one on the spacecraft design, this actually rescue the Japanese lunar mission, uh, which will be described later. And, and uh, to, to do that is sort of very rare. In fact, it's the first time I've ever heard it happening. Uh, and, and to come up with a new uh, way to get this particular Japanese spacecraft to the moon and rescue it seems fantastic, but it was actually based in a painting. Yeah, which is just amazing. So you could apply the same technique to, let's say, intimate relationship challenges, any sort of work problem, or something within your family. So even though science, the science technique, or you know, the science work has been Ed's forte, and he's you know gifted at that, you can use that for, wouldn't you say, just about anything, Ed? Yeah, yeah, so, so like, um, suppose you're in like, uh, which many people find themselves in, and, difficult relationship with somebody and you would like to um, resolve that, um, you might find that if you uh, keep, if you want to directly resolve it by talking to the person, 
usually it never works if you're not getting along. If you try to talk with them, they don't want to talk with you. <laughs> and it just does not work, and you actually make it worse. So you could put it out there to the universe, for example, that I would like to find a new way to resolve this issue with this person. And then you proceed to do a painting and see what it looks like and see if there's something in that painting that might help you. And if you're sort of tuned to that process and, and you did release your fears and you did let go, you may see something and then you go back to the person you can't talk with and then try it and see what happens. And, and it may really help. Right, so there, there has to be a way to let go of the angst and the worry. So that's probably the key thing, is that you can't really connect up with your higher self or the universe if you keep that worry or angst, wouldn't you say? And then for you, it's the artwork, and probably anybody, even though you're a professional you know, oil and acrylic painter that, that's come up with some beautiful things that you're selling professionally, you could still use that as a tool just to get your mind out of the way, or you could meditate, or find something that works for you. I used to do a lot of running, I would run and that would get me, get my brain out of the way. So to find something to actually help your brain stop thinking so much, is that pretty much what you would think, Ed, yeah. on that? Yeah, and, and if, if you're trying to resolve a difficult problem, like whether it be a really difficult relationship, or a problem you're trying to solve of any type, you know, I could, you could think of millions of them, but, but most people's first reaction is fear. That's always the, if a problem comes up that's bad, uh, that 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 really just stops you in your tracks, whatever it might be. The first reaction is 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 flight. It's fight or flight, and you get scared and there's fear and the adrenaline's going. And if you try to approach the problem from that point of view, it is absolutely impossible. It's impossible. It gets you absolutely nowhere. In fact, you may make you'll probably make it a million times worse. And uh, so the hardest thing to do when you're in the middle of something like that, like if you're, if you're arguing with somebody and you really want nothing more than to win the argument and show that they're complete idiots, I said that as a joke, um, and you're really, you're really based your thinking on that, it would, at the time it, it seems like really impossible to get out of that. Completely impossible. But if you force yourself to say, bite your tongue, get away from that, take a step away and say, you know, I'm going to try a new approach and really totally let go of that anger if you can possibly do that. Then you do a painting or whatever it is you might, you might want to use to relax, like Marina suggested running, but you, if, you're, if you play music, it could be that, or it could be maybe cooking something, but you purposely tell your mind, do not think about this problem and come back to it when you're done and then see what you get. Don't you think that that old beliefs and attitudes, that those are the things that can get in the way, like you said, oh, thinking somebody that is an idiot or having a certain viewpoint like you're right and they're wrong, don't you think that that's the thing that can get in the way too? Because really what it takes is a whole new perception and a whole new way of feeling about things. Don't you think that's what kind of brings things in as well, Ed? Yeah, yeah. Um, um, it's, it's a shift in the way you're thinking because, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to say I'm perfect. Whenever I get in arguments, I want to show that I'm right. And... I want to show that I'm absolutely right. No one's going to get in the way of that. But uh, if you think that way, you're never going to get. You're never going to solve it. It's just going to get worse and worse and worse. So um, you have to um, change your mode of thinking so that you do the. Basically, the the, the here's the here's the trick. I'll give you the trick of how you do this. You do the opposite. So if your if your pattern is to want to control it, you do the opposite. You let go of all control. Um, if you're trying to do a science problem, like you'll see later in this interview, um, and the usual way is to go to a computer and do high-powered math, the, I did the opposite, was do a painting. Um, these are things that are exactly the opposite. If, if, if you want to confront someone in a fist fight, you actually walk out of the room. Um, if you want to uh, make an argument with an IRS person, you hang the phone up and walk out of the room. Um, you do just the opposite of what you think you might want to do. In fact, it could even be worse. If you get a call up by the IRS and they want to, like, say you owe taxes, you say, do you want a bouquet of flowers? Um, you do exactly the opposite. And you'll find that if you do that, you release the fear and the anger and, and you put yourself in a different frame of reference. And then the universe can come in and, and literally miracles can happen. And you've definitely shown that in your own life. And I know you're going to go into that later. We have another kind of segment that we'll, we'll show as well, part two. So, so that's, that's really, that, you've really demonstrated that in your own life. 
Yes, uh, the, um, I've demonstrated, as, as, as Maureen said, you'll see in part two, where at one occasion in my life I had to go, had to, go to college and I had no funding, and, and my uh, parents said I had no funding, and, um, and I had to go to college, in a very expensive college, within a month with no funding to even pay the rent of the place I had to stay or the tuition. But I believed and let go, I believed it was going to be solved, and I let go of any kind of anxiety around it and just had a good time. And at the time I was into archery, so I did target practice. And I said, oh, this is fun, I'll just do that, I don't even worry about it. And um, a couple weeks later, um, I met a philanthropist, they paid for everything. Uh, not just undergraduate, but graduate school. And rent, and tuition, everything. And this came out of left field, and, I, I'm, and I'm convinced that it did so because I put it out there that I wanted to be helped with the funding, and I had a trust it was going to be helped, and I did the opposite. And that combination works. So it's put it out there, trust, do the opposite. So, well, that, that's something for all of us to really think about is how can we let go of that worry, those beliefs that are no longer serving us, the need to be right, you know, those depression or anger feelings that we have so that we can really let something totally new and something optimal for our life. And so, so I appreciate you talking about that. And the, yeah. and the other thing that I was really interested to have everyone hear about too, is I know when I, when I work with clients at Wings of Freedom, that to me, I always use a, temp, a healing template, recognizing that, you know, we had talked, we're going to talk about later about we know, you were saying that we probably know about 2% of the universe. And so 98% of the universe is really unknown. So in a sense, by letting go, we're tapping into that 98%. But... When I, you know, I, I come up with these healing templates to use, and one of them, to me, it looks like there's simultaneous realities going on that affect us. It's almost like we have all these influences that, that are in our life that, that affect us. So a lot of times I'll tell people, this is just what it looks to me, not to say it's ex accurate, but it works for healing purposes, is that probably 20% of our current life is, is what, what's affecting how we feel about things. The other 80% could be things like our ancestry and others, epigenetics, showing that we inherit probably 13 generations of our ancestors' memories and patterns and so forth. And then also we have different lifetimes, or you could look at them as an, an archetype if you're not somebody that doesn't believe in lifetimes. You could say past, present, future. But to me, it looks like we may have some simultaneous realities going on. Is there anything in the sciences that shows something about that, Ed? These simultaneous realities or universes? Yeah, um, the, the, there's several of them. And uh, they're discussed a bit in part two. <laughs> right. uh, but however, one I can discuss right now, which would be the, maybe the easiest one to discuss, is the idea of what's called quantum. It, it, it arises from the quantum world. The, that's the world of the atom. And even a bit small of the atom. So you've got a typical atom is hydrogen, right? So you've got a nucleus, which is a proton, and a neutron, and then, and then an electron is buzzing around it. And um, that's an atom. That whole thing is an atom. And, but you can go smaller than that and go inside of the nucleus and you get subatoms. And it's, that's called subatomic physics. Um, but involved with all this is the field of quantum mechanics. And the quantum mechanics says that when things get tiny, tiny, tiny like an atom, um, and they're tiny, I, you know, you could put trillions of them in, in a sugar cube. I mean, they're a little. Um, so uh, the, when you get down to atomic scales, uh, the phenomenon happens. And this was discovered, this was hypothesized in the 1920s by um, Schrodinger and Einstein and some other people in Germany, actually, uh, that, um, that an atom actually is not by itself. An atom actually has uh, two atoms in it that you can't see. It looks like one atom, but it's really two. And... Uh, Einstein didn't particularly believe this, but um, it's borne out, we think, by experiment today, that's probably true. So basically, an atom, you could take a hydrogen atom, or you could take a helium atom, whatever it is, and you look at it, it's actually got two of them, and they're distinguished by which way they spin. So if it spins to the right, that's one kind of spin. It spins to the left, that's another kind of spin. But if you look at an atom, an atom has both those spins going on simultaneously, so you don't see the two spins, you just see the atom. And the atom doesn't really sit there motionless, it's, it's, it's vibrating. 
And that vibration has within it those two spins. Now, the miraculous thing about this that Einstein didn't believe is that you can, you can um, separate the two spins. You can actually somehow, and this is so mysterious how physicists do this, but you can do this, you can separate the two spins, and what ends up happening is you get a duplicate of the atom at another location. But it's got a different spin. It's the same atom, it's a different spin. It looks the same, but it's got a different spin. And the miraculous thing about this is that that atom could be in the next universe, in, in the next galaxy, say 14 million light years away. Now, Einstein said, traveling at the speed of light, you can't go faster than that. That's the speed limit. So therefore, it should take 14 million years to send a signal from this other copy of this atom to the ones you have here, the, the two different spins, 14 million years, because the nearest galaxy is 14 million light years away. But what's, what, what quantum entanglement says is that it's felt instantly. There's no delay. So in other words, if you, if you, you have something 14 million light years away, but if you affect this atom here with one spin, it instantly affects the atom on the other end with the opposite spin, but it instantly affects it. And the reason Einstein didn't believe that is because his famous theory of relativity said nothing can go faster than the speed of light, so it should take 14 million years to go there. It shouldn't be instant. So he just didn't believe it. Nevertheless, he wrote a paper on it trying to disprove it. And he thought he had a proof that you couldn't do this. And as we found out in the 1990s, uh, probably early 1960s, I don't want to go into the history of quantum mechanics, but it was, it was shown that his paper was just not correct. And that, in fact, you can have quantum entanglement. And experiments have been going on to show that one object can be in two places at once, which is hard to believe. Now, uh, this happens on the atomic scale, and they can do it for little tiny atoms. And, and so it opens up the door to the question, well, geez, could you do it to bunches of atoms? Could you do it to, like, a lot of atoms? And then, then, you, then you ask the question, could you do it for a rock? And then naturally, could you do it for a person? So these things aren't known. But, but let's suppose you could do it for a person. Let's suppose that every atom of a person's body could be separated in spin from every atom in the body, and you create another person where all the atoms are in the opposite spin. Let's suppose you could do that. That means that you have a duplicate of yourself, literally a duplicate, and that duplicate could be anywhere in the universe you want them. They could be 14 million light years away. They could be Mars away, which is only a couple million, a few million miles, like 40 million. It could be 14 billion light years away near the Big Bang itself. It could be anywhere. And that person will instantly be there and, and, and be in exact synchronization with you. Now, this is theoretically possible. This is not science fiction. And this, this makes the Star Trek transporter look like nothing. Because <laughs> the Star Trek transporter, that works the speed of light. So when the Star Trek people are beaming down to a planet, what they're doing is they're taking every atom of the person and they're beaming it on light waves somehow and, and recreating the person down below. But that can only happen at the speed of light. So if they want to use a transporter and go from, go from the Earth, for example, to the nearest star, Alpha Centauri, which is four light years away, it'll take four years to send that person there through the, the Star Trek transporter. But through quantum entanglement, it'll be instantaneous. There'll be no delay. So you can go boom, and the person's there. Now, what that person is like, who knows? I mean, but this is theoretically possible. So therefore, if you backtrack all this, you could sort of, if you believe this, if you believe that someday this will happen, and if, and if you do believe that a person can have a quantum entangled other person, then what this means is that you are simultaneously living in two different universes at every moment. Now think about that. So this means that as you do something, it's not just you doing something, it's you and your quantum copy doing something. And that gives an entirely different um, view of, of our reality. So if you Definitely. believe in a quantum copy of yourself, with you at all times, this means that a lot of the phenomenon that I'm not going to even begin to get into, and Maureen would know more about this than me, but it could be the, a lot of these weird phenomena that one sees in, in spiritual circles or talks about, like past lives and all this. It could be that it's due to a quantum entangled person within you, and you don't see that person. They're sort of in your squelched down somehow in your energy field, but it could be there. And 
Therefore, when, when somebody is doing something and they see weird effects going on, it's not like UFOs or anything, it's your other self expressing itself. And that, that could be true. So, the, and scientifically, there's no reason why that could not be true. Uh, there's, there's, from my background in science, um, there's no reason, there's no laws of physics currently preventing that from being true. Well, it is fascinating. I kind of, in, in my job, which is more of a counseling, coaching type of a, a job, I do different techniques, and I kind of figure if, if somebody feels better, if it resolves something within them, and some people that can be like a miracle because they're ready, they resolve something very quickly, other people it's very slow and incremental, that there's something to a, a process or a technique, and basically working with past and simultaneous lifetimes has made a huge difference. I've been amazed that working with simultaneous lifetimes and, and acting as though they are real because they, they appear to be, and working with them that somebody can feel completely different after working with them. So it is just, it's interesting, you know, believe it or not, it's, it's you know, it's, it's something that helps a person feel better. So that's kind of how I gauge it. Yeah, and another thing I want to mention is along with what, what Maureen was just saying is that when you get down to the quantum level, um, there is the, the notion of what's called um, the Planck distance. That means if you get small enough that that what happens is within a certain distance, which is so tiny I can't even begin to express it, um, it is a distance called the Planck distance, which does exist, that within that, the laws of physics as we know it are no longer valid. And this is accepted in physics. There's no, this is not one of these edgy theories. It's called the Planck distance. And what's also demonstrated by the Planck distance is that it is possible, and it's certainly scientifically, I don't want to say demonstrated, but it wouldn't be out of the ordinary, that that time itself is not linear the way we experience it at, within the Planck distance. It could be the future, past, they're all sort of merged together um, and the whole concept of time is different. So this means that within us, our brain is actually working on the, on, on the, within the Planck distance because the neurons when they fire, they're, the firing is within the Planck distance. And this means that the, our brains are operating within this Planck distance. So on some level, our brains don't see time the way we see it normally. It sees it a lot different. So it's not out of the question that people can foresee the future because they're tapped into this and they're, they're, they're picking up the vibes of what their neurons are doing in the Planck distance. And that is certainly not my theory. This goes to an extremely famous scientist, uh, Penrose, uh, from Oxford or Cambridge University an extremely famous scientist, and he, he uh, wrote about this in one of his books, uh, um, The Emperor's New Mind, and um, it, it discusses this notion that the, the neurons of the brain operate within the Planck distance, and therefore all notions of space and time within our brain are not the same as we see them. Fascinating. Well, I, I really appreciate you know, Ed interviewing with me and Ed has all his published work that's on his website, edbelbruno.com, E-D-B-E-L-B-R-U-N-O.com. And also, he has all his paintings on there, too. You can either buy originals or duclays. I actually have both, and I just think they're just amazing. So it really speaks to me with, with the, the chaos art, the abstract, and then he also has some... I actually bought the one that's the orbit of the moon that, that helped you come up with the finding the orbit of the moon using uh, low or no fuel. So, mm -hmm. so check that out. And then part two, we're going to go more into Ed's story because I think it's fascinating how, how all these techniques, especially the letting go, has worked for Ed. So thank you so much and tune into part two.